what's going on YouTube what's happening welcome to or welcome back to Kovacs corner I appreciate you taking the time come through check out the video your boys dropping uh, we're about to hop on in to another grubby talks video uh, the true value of upgrades of Warcraft 3 the other day we were playing human and no <laughs> no more well maybe further on down the line just no not right now but anyway Feel free to hit me up on any one of my other social media platforms down in the description below. If you want to become a member of the channel, feel free to join the Discord, so on and so forth. You know the spiel. Everything's going to be down in the description below. Uh, Grubby's main channel and also this video will be down in the description below if you want to go and check it out yourself. Like and sub if this is something that you are into. Check out Grubby, King of the Orcs, one of the best Warcraft 3 players ever in my opinion. But yeah. Let's hop on into it and big shout out to Grubby for doing these videos for us to react to. Let's get into it. Oh wait, I'm going to rewind it a little bit. I had to do a little bit of justice. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another Warcraft 3 commentary video. I talk on this channel about three things. Things I think you guys want to hear about, things I think you guys need to hear about, and things I want to talk about. Today is going to be category number three, and hopefully you'll enjoy it as well. You see, I have been thinking a lot about this recently. I've been wanting to do a big expose about the role of unit upgrades in RTS games in general. I even started expanding the scope of my talking topic to unit upgrades beyond just real-time strategy games, including turn-based strategy games. I realized the topic is so big that it cannot possibly be done by me with my current... It is such a vast topic to talk about for upgrades, and it goes beyond RTS games, as he was saying, because it go dungeon crawler games, FPS games, like so on and so forth. Right? It's quite a topic to be talking about. You games. I realize that the topic is so big that it cannot possibly be done by me with my current experience of talking about it, without first going into something where I have a much greater level of expertise. Warcraft three unit upgrades. And I was working out the kinks and everything and trying to figure out what unit upgrades are worth, how to break it down and structure it in a way that it makes sense to people. And Know how long that must have took to categorize everything? Look, man. Like, adaptive master trainings, bro, plus cost generation and all that. That, like, bro, that's crazy. Upgrades are worth, how to break it down and structure it in a way that it makes Individual sense to upgrades. People. And that people can start to appreciate just how Unit upgrades. deep and interesting and interconnected all the different upgrades are in a game like Warcraft 3. But also, it was sparked by a discussion on upgrades in general because I had seen a thread on Reddit where people were discussing unit upgrades in the new subreddit of Stormgate, and people were talking about are numerical upgrades a good thing in RTS games? Are they a bad thing? Should upgrades be more unique than just plus one attack, plus one armor? And that really got me thinking. So I'm thinking, what is the best way to do upgrades in RTS games? Uh, what creates the greatest level of enjoyment for people? What is the best to balance around with? And then I realized, okay, I need to map this out because otherwise I can't make sense of it. And I did. I mapped it out and we're going to be going through that tonight. We'll be talking about Warcraft 3 and upgrades and maybe you'll learn a little bit more about the game that we all love and maybe we'll all get a little bit more insight about the role that upgrades play in strategy games. And like think about this, this video is 58 minutes long. Imagine how long it took for him to categorize everything and to like work out all the kinks, how long he actually took to work on this video to present to us. You know what I'm saying? Like bro. Bravo. Bravo is all I could say. Hard work right there. If you're ready, let's begin. So, uh, there was also a thread here on Reddit. Uh, I just picked up Warcraft 3 again. Most of my RTS experience was in Starcraft. And star in Starcraft, upgrades make or break your game. It's typical to build a lot of Evo chambers and then get a lot of upgrades. But from what I've seen in Warcraft, unit upgrades aren't taken seriously at all when I watch streams of excellent players. In my games, I always try to fully upgrade my units, but I almost never see it in good players like Grubby. What's the reason for that? Are upgrades more situational? And if so, should I upgrade my units? I play Undead pretty... That's actually a pretty good question. 
standards with DK Panda Lich. <laughs> That's not standard. <laughs> that is not standard Panda, but okay. Uh, that's cool. Uh, most of it made sense and uh, a, a very recognizable actually because this is how many people do upgrades in an RTS. Uh, without the time pressure of an opponent it seems to make a lot of sense to get a lot of upgrades because then your units have more value and they're better and then once you're done with all that then you start conquering the map, right? And maybe in campaigns sometimes that's true if the develop It's more so build an army quick get your levels up quick in order to attack and whoever could like get the bigger units first usually ends up winning are conquering the map right and maybe in campaigns sometimes that's true if the developer didn't put a lot of pressure on you early but what is the total value of upgrades and why do we get them and why do we like them well let's jump into that so it is going to be a very nerdy topic. We'll go into a lot of uh, general stuff and also a lot of numerical stuff. So first of all, there is what upgrades actually bring you in terms of fun, right? It's fun to upgrade your units. You've got the power fantasy of growth. You're investing in the value of your current units and of future units. Uh, the amount of upgrades that you have can dictate the pacing of gameplay flow because Facts. after all, if you just finish an upgrade, your entire army gets a little stronger than it was before. This gets globally uh, upgraded instantly. If I discover a new type of shield in my castle, you on the front line immediately get that upgraded shield. So uh, once you get that upgrade, everything gets stronger and you can base an attack timing around that time. Uh, the avoidance of redundancy. Basic units can become less basic. Think, for instance, of the Mutalisk unit in StarCraft. Uh, in StarCraft 1, it can turn into a Guardian or a Devourer, which are both much more purpose-driven unit. The Guardian is a long-range siege unit, and the Devourer is an anti-air support unit. So you can go away from one unit and become another, so you can make them more advanced. Uh, preparation. An unupgraded unit heralds the value of its upgrades as an option. So by that, uh, you have an unupgraded unit that can research true seeing. It doesn't have it yet, but he's a herald of an upgrade to come. Uh, once you get the upgrade for sentinels on huntresses, you gain the ability to use them as a form of true sight with the, with the owls on the trees in Warcraft 3. Just so that you're able to gain information of any kind of units from your opponents moving around. So now you're more prepared. Or even if they're trying to like rush you or try to push into your base, you have the foresight before they even get there of seeing them come. For uh, opponent cloaked units, for instance, right? That too. Uh, choice and direction. When you invest in a certain direction with your upgrades, it can make switching into another unit more costly. While that sounds like a bad thing, you know, I've already invested in unit A, now unit B is completely unupgraded, should I even be going for it? While that sounds like a bad thing, it's a good thing, because it makes our choices more meaningful. Uh, just like in an ARPG game, where doing a respec of your character is somewhat costly at least. It costs some measure of gold, or time, or experience points. That feels a little bit more like a meaningful decision. Uh, then in newfangled games where developers coddle players and allow any amount of respecking, any amount of times, uh, it makes it feel like any of our choices are less permanent and less meaningful. Uh, not to say that I don't like respecking, but I will say that in Divinity 2 Original Sin, the fact that I know that I can respec at any time can make me prepare for any challenge with a completely respect character. And it feels a little easy, so I deliberately artificially limit myself to not do it because it feels too good, it feels too powerful. Whereas if you take a game like Path of Exile, if you do a respect there, the longer you wait, the more it costs you, right? And in Diablo 2, you can't respect at all. <laughs> you can. Well, not Diablo 2 itself, but D2R. And LOD, you can respect, but you can only respect once unless you want to get the token. It takes time and effort to make the token in order to respect again. Until I think maybe there was like one or two ways to respect, but mostly in Diablo 2, if you bricked your character, uh, you just had to start a new one. <laughs> yeah, so that felt uh, very. But then later you could res. 
Or could you respec with certain uh, Horatio Cube formulas? There is one quest that allows you to respec, and eventually they added it. Ah, uh -huh. yeah. Uh, yeah, but back when, when I was playing, you couldn't. If you did one wrong point, you bricked your character, you had to restart. I remember so that. There is a kind of inertia to getting upgrades, right? Then I want to talk a little bit about what kind of upgrades are there in Warcraft 3 uh, and in general, but specifically focused on Warcraft 3. There are a lot of different upgrades, and there's a lot of confusion about when you should be getting which upgrades. And people aren't that sure of the exact value of upgrades, and you can see this because even some high-level players sometimes get, what I would say, the wrong upgrade. And I've learned a lot about Warcraft upgrades myself when researching this topic. So let's jump into types of upgrades. So, you have the qualitative upgrades. Uh, these are anything that incre increase the quality of that which you have. Uh, so you've got speed upgrades, range upgrades, caster upgrades, site hero upgrades, utility upgrades, building upgrades, unit transformation. So an example of a speed upgrade would be, and these are the only ones I can think of, if there are more let me know, Ghoul Frenzy makes ghouls faster. Yep. Uh, Berserker, Berserker upgrade is a headhunter transformational upgrade. Uh, but it actually gives them 20% bonus movement speed when activating the Berserker activation. The tooltip only reads uh, bonus attack speed and bonus damage received. It doesn't talk about movement speed. But anyone that has used it must have had an inkling that the Berserkers get a little faster. So it's a speed upgrade. And they've got range upgrades for the Rifleman and Archer. And to a degree for the Chimera Corrosive Breath. Though it's only range upgrade against buildings. Which is essentially what they use for is to go and demolish a whole, a whole town like a bunch of structures. And you've got cast upgrades. Get rid like of a base. Master training. Uh, you've got heroes which are casters. They can get their skill points. Uh, sight upgrades like ultra vision, fire sight, and the magic sentry. So that you get some form of true seeing and you get some extra vision sometimes. Uh, hero upgrades. There are only two actual hero upgrades. Namely, uh, Nature's Blessing, uh, upgrading the Force of Nature triads on Keeper of the Grove. And you've got Ultra Vision that can give female Knight of Heroes bonus vision. Uh, then you have Utility upgrades like Backpack. You've got Building upgrades such as Masonry, Spikes, Spike Barricades, uh, Magic Sentry, Nature's Blessing, Wellspring, Fragmentation Shards, which now works on Cannon Towers. That's crazy. And Reinforced Defenses on Burrows and Towers. Nice. And then you've got unit transformational upgrades, where the obsidian statue destroyer, becomes a destroyer. Druid of the Claw. And the Druid of the Claw. The, the bear becomes, I mean, the Druid becomes a bear. The Druid of the Talon becomes a crow. Raven. And the Berserker upgrade, the Headhunter becomes a Berserker. And the Gargoyle can become a statue. So these are some unit transformational upgrades, and then there may be some others as well. And then you've got the numerical upgrades and there is a lot to talk about when it comes to the, the numerical upgrades and we will because this is grubby talks so <laughs> we're gonna talk about it you've got the attack upgrades up to three and then you've got armor upgrades up to three and these are made through the upgrade buildings the war mill the hunter's hole the blacksmith and the graveyard right. so upgrades in warcraft 3 Upgrades in Warcraft 3 are researchable for heroes, units, and buildings. They can improve innate abilities or grant access to new ones. And here's that list that we talked about of all the different upgrades. That is so crazy. You can get. As you can see, there are quite a few. And it stands to reason that when you're playing a game of Warcraft 3, you're not going to get all of them. But it can be really hard to see the forest with all the trees that are here. And therefore it is good to understand a little bit the value of different upgrades and to understand the direction that you might be wanting to go. When is it worth to get upgrades is a question I often get. So let's talk a little bit about... So yeah, I'm a little bit curious about that too because my whole thinking when it goes into doing upgrades is to try and get the upgrades as quick as possible, especially for attack and or defense depending on what your opponent is. like. During Undead, we try to go for the attack first for Fiends, and then uh, go for the defense, right? But if they're coming through with a bunch of grunts, it's better to get the defense before the attack. It's all about hindsight. But the pros and cons for upgrades. The advantages of upgrades. They're a way to improve your army, 
uh, you can create a higher level of cost effectiveness per one unit. Right? An upgraded unit is worth more than an unupgraded unit. When you get upgrades, it doesn't cost supply, it doesn't cost population size. You can still improve your army strength and invest in them when you are supply blocked. So if you forgot to make that burrow, you forgot to make the farm, the moon well, then you can still use your money to invest into some attack and armor upgrades, even if otherwise you may not have do done it right now. Because, yeah. you know, you're supply blocked and there's no point locking three grunts in your barracks just waiting for that burrow to finish. You can get an upgrade instead. You can still improve your army strength and invest in them when you're already maxed out at 100 hundredth. Or you can use upgrades in Warcraft 3, and this is very unique about Warcraft 3. You can still use upgrades to in improve your army strength and invest in them when you're intending to stay in no upkeep and when you're intending to stay in low upkeep. Now, I don't want to go too deep into the upkeep system of Warcraft 3, but suffice to say that if you go to 51 population and above, you lose 30% of all sources of gold income, literally. Wow. And I didn't know that. If you go to 81 or higher, you go to high upkeep and you lose 60% of all sourced gold income. And you may have a question for me, does it also affect... Yes, yes it does. All sources of gold income. Every single one you can think of, and if you want to think about it, there's more than six sources of gold income, and they all are all effective. Then uh, you can also proactively improve your army strength. So that's essentially why they only go to about 40, 50 um, population overall. Because like, if you stay under 50, you're at like a low income, which is fine, right? You're still able to collect 10 gold per unit that goes through the gold mine and such and then same with lumber unless you have the upgrade for lumber where you're able to get like 15 20 whatever it is yeah that's that's crazy i just learned something new we all just learned something new if you already do about that smash that like button strength and invest in upgrades when approaching any of these thresholds so you don't need to wait until you get supply blocked or until you get to 100 population max or until you nearly reach the no upkeep threshold, you can see that moment happening in the future and proactively coordinate the investments in active unit production and the investments into research since you know you are going to be making a soft stop in unit production for some period of time so you can start getting one upgrade now at least. Uh, upgraded units that die don't give more XP than unupgraded units, even though they are stronger. It was harder to kill them, and those units were more lethal before they died. So when it comes to value of a unit versus experience it gives, there's nothing more juicy in experience than a fully unupgraded unit. Make sense? It does make sense. Hold on, give me one second. A fully upgraded unit is the least valuable to kill when it comes to extracting experience out of the experience of killing them. Right? Newly produced units come out with all researched upgrades already. So yep. if there is a catastrophic meteorite event that wipes out all the dinosaurs, if they had upgraded themselves, then they would come back with bonus stat points. And right? if you lose your whole army, you start making new units again. They're all already upgraded. Nice. Uh, upgrades globally apply to existing units. So upgrades don't have travel time. If I'm on a really big FFA map and I've got six Chimera and I get an attack upgrade finished, which nice. takes 60 seconds to research, then uh, that instantly affects my six Chimera next to the enemy base. If I had made a seventh Chimera instead, that also takes 60 seconds, but it now starts at home in my base and has to travel by itself over the map to rejoin my army. It could be caught, it could be killed, and it will arrive later than the attack upgrade. So, it is indeed an upgrade advantage over active unit production that they apply globally. Upgrades may also unlock abilities which alter the way units can be used. Strategies and tactics can be played and implemented. 
if so hold on that that is pretty crazy overall right like obviously if you're rolling around with a bunch of units and you're researching the attack or the defense upgrade as you're in the midst of battle let's say let's say that you get a defense upgrade you're in the midst of battle you you got some like footies against grunts grunts well destroy for like takes one grunt he could destroy one and a half footies we'll say right for damage before the footies take him out kind of thing if it's like a 1v1 he'll destroy a footy and then he might be able to take potentially half the life of a second footy but in the midst of that battle let's say you're about halfway with your footy you get the defense upgrade with it you potentially have a better chance of survival and beating said grunt with that one footy map to rejoin my army it could be caught it could be killed and it will arrive later than the attack upgrade so it is indeed an upgrade advantage over active unit production that they apply globally. Upgrades may also unlock abilities which alter the way units can be used. Strategies and tactics can be played and implemented. A raider without ensnare just has siege damage and is fast and is a poor fighter. But with ensnare, they can start cancelling channeling ultimate abilities. They can cancel staff of teleportation. They can lock down units. So even if I upgrade my raiders to 3-3 three, three attack and armor, and I've got three raiders, uh, they only have three and snare cooldowns. Whereas if I have six raiders instead, which is cheaper than three raiders with 3-3 three, three upgrades, they have six and snares. Right? So this changes the way you can Double play. Double up. Oh, I, we found one example. Unsummoning buildings does not, uh, does not get taxed. Which makes sense, because those buildings already belong to you. Uh, one time I sent a package with the U.S. mail uh, to an address in the U.S. While I was in the U.S., I sent a package of things that belonged to me. I was looking to sell them, a set of Pokemon cards, to a website. And they sent it back to me because they said the cards were not the ones that I said they were. They didn't want to buy them. So they sent them to my address in the Netherlands. And then the Netherlands Customs charged me taxes on it because the advertised value on the Pokemon cards was $200. Even though the company that appraised them said it's not $200, it was actually less than that, but they still put $200 on the package and now I'm being taxed $70 just to import cards that supposedly I bought from the US, which I didn't, they're mine. <laughs> yeah, that's why I thought unsummoning was also subject to tax because uh, of the Pokemon. Customs. I just left them there. I didn't want them back anymore. Now, someone became a Pokemon card game fan at Customs, no doubt. Anyway, <laughs> small tangent, let's move on. There are disadvantages to upgrades as well. There is a wait time. Upgrades last anywhere from 30 to 90 seconds, usually. So, the average being half a minute to a minute and a half. Being about 60 or a little over 60 seconds. The average standard unit production cycle is about 30 seconds. 30, the 45 seconds. Camera are also about 60 seconds. So upgrades last on average a little longer than a unit. Upgrades have a limited effect on small scale armies. And numerical unit upgrades steeply go up in price. Usually the first upgrade costs a joint amount of about 150 to 175 resources in terms of gold and lumber. And that makes it cheaper than most units, the first upgrade. The second upgrade costs about 325, 350, 375 resources with gold and lumber added together, and that's more than most units, or about equal to most mid-game units. Whereas the final upgrade, 3 attack and 3 armor, uh, the third one anyway, uh, costs about 550 resources, and that is more expensive than all but the Frostworm and the Chimera, uh, pretty much. So, uh, very sense. expensive, they go up quite a bit in price. Uh, though not progressively so. Um, it's almost like it's only, it's pretty much worth to get level 2 and level 3 situational. Another disadvantage of upgrades, it creates unit switch inertia. You can have 3-3 three, three upgraded knights because you are feeling really good about making knights and making them valuable, but now you're up against Chimera 
and the night upgrades do Useless. not transfer over to riflemen upgrades at all. The riflemen are still zero zero. So there is an inertia in switching over to another unit. If you overinvest in upgrades that you're not sure are not going to be turned obsolete at some point during the game. Upgrades also do not affect your heroes, except for those two exceptions, Ultra Vision and Force of Nature uh, upgrade via Nature's Blessing. So any upgrades you get, so long as heroes are also gaining in power level, uh, and so long as heroes might even be very strong against certain units, uh, well, you're not investing in the value of your heroes in particular with unit upgrades. Armor upgrades don't do anything if a unit that has an armor upgrade don't get attacked. You could be playing with three armor upgraded grunts, three armor upgraded wind riders, and three armor upgraded headhunters, but perhaps the opponent undead is only focus firing your farseer, uh, which ends up dying, which means your armor upgrades did nothing, right? Whereas attack upgrades maybe would have done something in that situation by providing more powerful lethal cover fire. So an armor upgrade on a unit at least requires it to reasonably want to be attacked by an opponent. Armor upgrades do not increase the speed of killing enemy buildings or creeps, right? Enemy buildings or neutral creeps do not die faster when you invest in armor upgrades. Armor upgrades also only provide physical protection. They cannot be uh, doing any mitigation against spell damage like Stormbolt, Chain Lightning, Shockwave, Blizzard, Flame Strike. All of that bypasses armor upgrades. And so sometimes I look at an enemy army, I see that they have Blizzard and Thunderclap, and I have a bunch of Grunts, and they have a bunch of Spellbreakers, and then I think, I could get armor upgrades here, but they're mostly going to be Blizzard and Clapped. So I'm trying to make a judgment in my head that's probably 70% hero spell damage, and 30% sorceresses, priests, and Spellbreakers. I might not get an armor upgrade, because it while an armor upgrade gives a certain bonus effective health, it doesn't actually end up realizing its potential because most of the damage is spell. And in Warcraft 3 there are also two very niche uh, that I can think of, purely potentially negative outcomes uh, that relate to the Chimera and the Burrow. If you attack an Orcish base with Chimera and they have heavy armor Burrows, and the Chimera is unupgraded, it has a 100 damage magic damage attack that deals 200% damage against Burrows. If you upgrade the Chimera to get Corrosive Breath, their attack type against buildings changes to Siege damage, which is great against 95% of the buildings in the game, but not against Heavy Armor Burrows or Heavy Armor Walking Ancients of War. So usually you might want to upgrade Corrosive Breath as you fly your Chimera to the Orc base in secret to blow up their base. And then as you see their burrows, if they're still heavy armor, you cancel the Corrosive Breath upgrade before it finishes. But if they're fortified, then you let it finish. So you start the upgrade as an option, but you end up canceling it if you see the situation is different than what you maybe were anticipating. So like... It's, it's all about the knowledge of what is going on and being able to foresee and predict. Also, as he was saying, let's have the Chimera send it over to the other base and start doing the upgrade. And if you notice the difference, cancel the upgrade and start doing something else. That, wow. That is crazy to think about. It's all about the knowledge of what's going on, what the opponent is doing what they're planning to do and then counteracting the, what it is that they're trying to do but if they end up seeing your chimera they might already think that you've already done the upgrade and then they're like ah oh, snap now we got to do this to counteract your chimera and even in that instinct it's like i bet because they've seen the chimera they believe this i'm gonna go this but it could go left anytime right this, by the way, this is an option, it's just a kind of deep strategy, but there are some downsides. Okay, let's talk about the numbers, the base damage, the damage range via dice roll, adding dice per upgrade, armor, and effective physical HP. Okay, so uh, let's go take a look at the Liquipedia attack damage page. 
So attack damage refers to, of course, the attack of a unit, and it's pretty interesting how Blizzard built the attack damage for units. Uh, if we take a look at the footman, for instance, the footman's base damage is 12 to 13. There is damage range in Warcraft 3, unlike in a game like Starcraft 1 or Starcraft 2. So how does this work, 12 to 13? Well, it's pretty simple. A footman has a base damage of 11. And then they have a hidden base damage. Both are hidden. We, we only see the 12 to 13, but you can see it in the map world editor. Uh, they have a base damage of uh, 11 damage. And then they have a dice roll, a die roll, I should say, of 1 to 2. And together that comprises 12 to 13. The chance that he rolls 12 damage or the ch chance that he rolls 13 damage is both 50% chance. And when he gets an attack upgrade, what, what they do simply is to add one die roll to his damage. So at level 1 attack upgrade, he will have 13 to 15, then 14 to 17, and finally 15 to 19. So it's one dice roll, one die roll I really should say, per attack upgrade for the footman. Uh, heroes, from what I understand, use two die roll on top of their hidden base damage. Really? So of course, they do not benefit from blacksmith upgrades. That's so true. Every Warcraft 3 unit has a hidden base damage and a hidden bonus damage via either one or several dice roll. So it all depends on items that you end up obtaining for your hero, as you guys have seen the way how we end up playing some of the heroes and stuff like that, what we end up trying to pair with the heroes if we want them for more defense so that they're more strong tanky or if we want them for more attack which is usually uh, a ranged unit like Lich, we'll try to get Lich up and then like DK will make him more tanky. The advertised unupgraded value is the result but it's of circumstantial. adding those values together. You can see the values in the world editor and you can intuit it via Liquipedia's stats. The unit attack upgrades add a die roll of the predetermined amount 1 to x, 1 to 2, 1 to 3, 1 to 11 damage to their total damage output. And we just talked about this. But let's talk about the expected outcomes of that damage range. because. If you have one die roll in life, let's say a 1d6, the chance that you get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6 are all equal. There's an equal amount of chance to roll any of those. But the moment you have more than one die roll, you start having a more middling result. And while I don't have the words to describe what that means categorically, uh, Liquipedia does, base damage is a deterministic number constant for units and based on the primary attributes for heroes. On top of the base damage, a stochastic value is added. <laughs> wow. The stochastic value is the addition of random events with uniform discrete distribution in the interval of <laughs> one to M, where M and R are predefined for each unit. I just start zoning out when I read stuff like this. That I think is crazy. stochastic is a very cool word, but I don't know what it means. I don't know what the rest means either. Damage range of a unit is then the interval uh, for units using one dice. Each damage number in this interval has the same probability of occurrence. That's what hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. He's right because like I want to, I want to know what this word is. Give me a second here. We're gonna Google this. Hit Google up. Involving a random variable. Stochastic possesses two involving chances of probability. Involving a random variable is what this word means. That's nuts. So see you look, man. We're, we're learning stuff new all day. <laughs> what I just said in layman terms, right? Whereas for units using two dice, the value in the center is most likely. And if you knew what that word was, drop a thumbs up. <laughs> if you roll two d6, 
Uh, that is to say, Correct. two dice with six sides to the die, right? You can roll one one in only one possible outcome. Both die have to roll into one, and that is how you get the value two. So the only way you can roll two is if both go to one and one, and that is a that has a single outcome possibility of happening. And the same thing for 12. You need 6-6 six, six to get 12. But once we start looking at something in the middle, say for instance 7, you can reach 7 by rolling 1-6, 2-5, 3-4, 4-3, 5-2, six, and 6-1. That is a lot of potential outcomes, and this is both in layman terms logical, and this is also how it actually turns out when you start testing it a lot. It makes sense. This is, so this is also true then for units in Warcraft 3. The more unit upgrades you get, the larger the range of the footman's potential outcome gets. He could high roll with 19 or he could low roll with 15, but he's most likely going to do 17 damage. And he's definitely going to average 17 damage. Of course it is possible in some game that the footman will hit 19 damage seven times in a row, but it's actually not going to happen. It is so stratospherically unlikely to happen that it's probably not going to happen. It, re it goes to the middle, right? So that is about how attack damage works. Now let's look at how, at how armor works. And also, we should look a little bit about the percentages of damage that you receive when you get an attack upgrade. As I mentioned, it actually adds about 12% damage when you get when you do the calculation. So for Chimera, for instance, the, the damage gain per three upgrades is 3 to 33, as you can see here. And that means that one die roll is 1 to 11. Their base damage is 44, and they get 1 to 11 at base level, and 1 to 11 per attack upgrade. And so when you start doing the maths and you see, hey, the base damage is 45, we see that right here, uh, and the highest range is 55 for this siege damage attack, right? So if you add the two together and then you divide it by two, you can see that the average base, base damage is 50. Right? We can see that intuitively when we look at 45, 55, they have an average base damage of 50. So the amount of damage added by a correct. single beast upgrade for Night Elf is 1 to 11. You add 1 to 11, that's 12. You divide it by 2, that's 6. So how much is 6 on top of 50 base damage? Well, that's 56 divided by 50, 1.12. So that is a 12% damage increase on the base amount of damage per upgrade. And it gets a little more interesting because we can see that one attack upgrade gives a Chimera 12% bonus damage. But my question to you is, is the second attack upgrade as valuable as the first? Well, the second upgrade adds the same die roll. Adds it 0.5. also adds 1 to 11 damage. So it looks like the second attack upgrade is equally valuable as the first. However, the unit already has their first attack upgrade by now. So is their current double? attack is not uh, 50, it's 56. But they're still getting six per level, six average damage. So now they're no longer getting 12% on their current damage. They're only getting 12% bonus damage on their erstwhile base damage. So the new attack upgrade might only be adding something like 11, 10, 9% bonus damage on their current amount. And upgrades start getting more expensive. So it's very, very interesting. Each attack upgrade for the footman adds an expected value of 1.5 bonus damage. This is not a 12% damage increase on the base amount per upgrade, only on the first, right? As the value added is 1.5 for every level, but the base you increase from now is larger, that means a footman with a level one attack upgrade has an expected value of 14 damage, which is 12% higher than their base damage on upgrade of 12.5. However, since the level 2 upgrade increases footman damage by that same 1.5, but the base is now 14, the relative increase is now 10.7%. That's... And... Wow. When you get to the final attack upgrade, they get only 9.7% bonus attack damage, 
based on going from level two to three. Coming from the and base. And from the work of community. Like the base me power. This paragraph, as I was trying to think about this. So thanks for that. Very interesting. So now we know a little bit more about attack damage and that while you get a linear bonus advantage because they are better than they were after the first upgrade, the actual relative increase has a drop off. Now the, the only way that I see for upgrading to be worthwhile is only if you upgrade twice. Like obviously the first upgrade, huge, right? And then the only other upgrade where you're actually obtaining that extra value from, and depending on how long the game goes, is the second one. Uh, the only time that you would get a third one is circumstantial or if you have enough resources in order to do it and just like show off a little bit, I guess. Now let's start, take a look at armor upgrades. Each point of armor, and this, by the way, this has confused me and many people for a long time. So it's about time that there is an expose on how upgrades <laughs> work in Warcraft 3. I'm sure many of you have struggled to live life normally functioning as a human being in society, not knowing exactly whether armor upgrades have diminishing returns or not in Warcraft 3. And therefore, I am happy to open the books on that answer once and for all. because. If you go to any unit inside Warcraft 3, you can look at a unit, hover over their armor stat, and you can see the percentage of damage, damage reduction, 19%. Reduction. Ooh, okay, that's cool. So we look at a knight that has 28 armor, or we look at a hero that has 28 armor or whatever with inner fire, protection scroll, three armor upgrades, and we see what is the value of damage reduction, 58% from 28 armor. But then we think, hey, I learned from that Grubby Talks video that one armor upgrade, which is two armor, gives 12% effective health. So if two armor is 12% effective health, how can Warcraft the game tell me that 28 armor, which would be 14 upgrades, is only 58% damage reduction? Well, it actually makes sense. Allow me to explain. Right? Yes, we have to look explain, at all these curves please. for Dota 2 as well. That's right. So, here's how armor works in Warcraft 3. Each point of armor increases the effective health of a unit by 6% of the unit's base hit points. And EHP, effective health, is a much used term to say, well, they don't have more hit points, but because it's harder to damage them by 12%, uh, there's a damage reduction component, their EHP, their effective hit points, is up by that much. But I would posit, we should call this physical, physical effective hit points, or PEHP. Now, this is an important distinction because, as I mentioned, spell damage bypasses their physical protection. If you purchase something in a shop that says you're EHP is going up in 12% and you get killed by a coil, you're going to be really mad because they did, they falsely advertised it. It's PEHP. All right, so armor upgrades in Warcraft 3 give plus two armor. It doesn't matter whether it's to an archer, a chimera, or to a footman, or a druid of the claw. It's always 12% EHP for every armor upgrade you get. And that is on the base amount of health and survivability that you have. Note, this means Blizzard created a wonderfully consistent system of 12% effectiveness per blacksmithing upgrade, whether you get attack or armor. And I, I like that, and it's really clean. I used to think attack upgrades are roughly 10%, and I knew that armor is 12%, but it's actually both 12%. Which is which, pretty cool, uh, it's even. Really cool. And this is a percentage, uh, there, there is an equivalence to the percentages here, which I think is really clean. You look at a game like StarCraft, there is an equivalence in absolute numbers. One armor is blocking one damage, not a percentage, just one armor is one damage blocked. And one attack is one extra damage dealt. There are no percentages and damage range. But Warcraft 3 has more RNG, and on this stream, and on this channel, 
we love RNG. I like games with a bit of luck so that you can learn how to master chaos, the <laughs> chaos of the universe itself in the microcosm of a challenging game environment. That's I a good way of looking at it. Bad luck, good luck, I'll take all of it. So due to the consistency of armor, the amount of effective hit points is always increased by the same absolute amount per point of armor, regardless of the current armor rating. But the relative increase in effective hit points per armor is reduced for higher armor ratings compared to lower armor ratings. Additionally, Makes sense. spell damage bypasses physical armor altogether, right? Because it's spell damage. Pep instead of ep. The balance between armor and attack upgrades. Attack upgrades are better. This is an opinion. This is not maths. This is my opinion and I think it's shared by many. Let's look at why attack upgrades in Warcraft 3 are better than armor upgrades. In so like a good majority of the time when you, whenever you see me playing Warcraft 3 the first thing that I try to go for is an attack upgrade because I feel the same way but that's from like years of paying attention to the way how grubby used to play orcs Warcraft 3 and now attack how he plays help you creep faster yeah creeping is the term de designated to killing the by blizzard named creep caps creep caps are neutral NPC conglomerations gnolls wolves bears etc uh, you know Neutral creeps that guard a certain area, they have gold, item, XP, and they protect valuable locations. If you want to kill them, attack upgrades helps. Armor upgrades does not help to kill them faster. In other RTS games, you scale up the value of your empire by getting upgrades, obtaining more resources, uh, covering a larger part of the map, and getting more units. But in Warcraft 3, part of your power growth strategy is by adding more value to your heroes and creeping is a really large part of that so attack upgrades unlock that ability for you to do so more quickly by spending less time in a certain creep camp location and then being able to move on to the next one more quickly as creeping in warcraft 3 is a zero-sum game with creeps not respawning like in a game such as dota 2 or league of legends it is important that you get the biggest piece of the pie having more attack upgrades and more damage and more lethality you creep faster that might net you one or two extra bonus creep camps than an opponent no. and then also you have to take in consideration about the level of your hero because ultimately who has the higher level hero it's all circumstantial but a good majority of the time the person who has the higher level hero comes out on top faster that might net you one or two extra bonus creep camps that an opponent now is not getting or in a moment of contestion where both of you are headed to the same area, it might make the difference between you not getting creepjacked by an opponent, which means being backstabbed and attacked from behind while you're doing a creep camp, and maybe you're already done with it and now you're more ready for the opponent. So attack upgrades help you creep faster. They help you kill buildings faster. Most buildings do not fight back, and even if they do, usually the goal is to kill the building fast, not to go to a building and then take less damage. That's usually not the goal, because you could just not go there, right? Attack upgrades help you kill heroes faster. Heroes have their own armor upgrades via levels, uh, items, and HP. And if you want to kill heroes, if your strategy is focusing heroes, then attack upgrades help with that. 100%. Attack upgrades help you to kill and focus fire enemy you And a good majority of the time, too, whenever you're playing up against an opponent, especially in 1v1s, you want to focus their hero down because their hero has the higher attack plus whatever attributes that they bring to the table on top of whatever gear it is that they have found along the way, which could increase their attack, defense, so on and so forth. And whatever it is that their hero is holding on to, like it could be a horn, of, a horn of storm wind, which increases the attack and or defense of other units that are following behind your hero. Get that bonus as well, right? So get rid of the hero, get rid of the bonus, makes the units a little bit easier to deal with. By that time, they're probably retreating. Attack upgrades help with that. Attack upgrades help you to kill and focus fire enemy units faster, dropping enemy damage output, which in itself serves as a kind of defensive measure. 
and killing an enemy unit means that it can no longer hit you, so you don't need armor as much if the enemy is dead. Just like in Starship Troopers, the enemy can't fire a nuke if you <coughs> injure their hand. Killing something faster also gets you experience, which may create level ups to gain crucial new power levels. Medic! <laughs> to gain crucial new power levels to heroes in an ongoing fight. Sometimes, though, armor upgrades can be better. The more armor, well, actually, the more survival. That's circumstantial as well. Are, right? Rings of protection, uh, you know, being able to save themselves. With it's for the heroes, though, and that's the more items obtained it is that your units from creeping. Fired instead. Where you want so the attack of the unit higher. To prevent all of those same advantages that an opponent has with attack upgrades. Well, almost all the same. Killing buildings and creeps does not interact with your opponent's units. But killing units faster, well, armor helps to prevent that, right? If your only hero is a paladin with divine shield, then you should very likely invest in armor upgrades because the paladin ain't getting focused anyway. Some units just get hit more than they apply hits. Think for instance of spellbreakers, grunts, knights, and mountain giants, right? It's especially true for melee units. These units, they run at an opponent, they'll try to get hits in, but they're taking damage from the entire enemy ranged squadron. Archers and huntresses are going to be hitting your grunts, and unless your shamans are out of position, those shamans aren't getting hit. So grunts are what is getting hit, and therefore they benefit wonderfully from armor upgrades. Sometimes armor is much better than attack, because that grunt maybe is getting one, two, or three hits on an archer, but he's receiving 20, 30, 40, 50 archer shots before he even gets there. The more HP a unit has, the more an upgrade also helps. And one advantage that I didn't list here is that because armor adds EHP or PEHP, uh, healing becomes more valuable as well. A heal on an unarmored unit for 200 gives you 200 health, but a heal on a unit that has 60 armor it is like as if that heal gave 600 health because that health was so hard to take down and now you give a 200 HP heal and that's going to be hard to take down as well. So the more unit, the more HP a unit has or the more HP it receives via healing, the more valuable armor upgrades are. High health totals include these above melee units. And then armor also has unique interactions in some situations such as Batrider Unstable Concoction uh, after all, concoction is either going to kill a unit or it's not. A bat rider will kill a gargoyle, but if the gargoyle has three armor upgrades, then it will not. We saw no, that but it, it'll in hurt the it. Happy versus Lin match we saw uh, that we watched in game two, where gargoyles survive bat rider explosions because of the armor. And by the way. Attack upgrades do not help Batrider Unstable Concoction, so it isn't even about any of the stuff we talked about before. It's just about, do you have three armor upgrades? If yes, your gargoyle survives, and if no, it dies, right? So that's pretty unique. Then armor helps reduce damage taken from creeps. So it does help a bit with creeps, but I will say that the better you are as a player, the less it matters whether you have armor upgrades when it comes to meeting creeps. Many Night Elf players will get either their Ancient of War or their Demon Hunter focused, rather than their Archers, Huntresses, or Dryads. And therefore, it's really about how much health, armor, and saves your main hero has or the Ancient of War, rather than your units. Now, armor upgrade level 1 can be cheaper than attack upgrade level 2. So while I said attack upgrades are better than armor, it can at least be cheaper to get your armor level 1 after getting your attack level 1. Additionally, Makes sense. you might still be tier 1. Maybe you never went to tier 2, and that means that you cannot get upgrade level 2. Then maybe you'll get armor upgrade level 1 after getting your attack. And that's if you're like caught up, three like getting upgrades, stuck with the resources. Cool on attack upgrades, well, it's better to get an armor upgrade. It's the only way to add value to your unit, because you already fully upgraded your attack. Units that have special damage and effects may like armor upgrades in order to apply their effects more continuously. So this is very important for units that are less physical damage reliant. Take the following units. Torrents want to apply Pulverize, which does a 60 damage area of effect ability that can, it has a chance to proc. Boom. And when a Torrent does the Pulverize, people take 60 damage and it has nothing to do with their physical armor. 
So you can upgrade the, uh, the tar in, in attack damage, and it's kind of mad because their main damage output is the pulverize. It is a little bit bonus, but if you actually add the average amount of damage pulverize adds to tarn attacks, and I don't know the exact percentage of chance that it procs, and we definitely cannot calculate how many units he hits because that depends on the situation. But if you were to take all the pulverize that were ever done in the world, and you would you would see how much of an extra damage that constitutes, then you would realize that an attack upgrade cannot possibly add 12% lethality on a tauren because part of the damage comes from the pulverize. So maybe wouldn't it make more sense to get armor upgrade instead? so that you can be alive for longer as a Tauren, so that you can apply uh, Pulverize more often. And the same is true for Dryads. Dryad Slow Poison does an attack, movement slow, and it also does damage over time. So again, it is not no longer a 12% damage increase for her when she gets an attack upgrade. Even though physically that's true, that's not true when you take everything into account. Same is true for Windrider and Venom Spears, Destroyer with his Orb of Annihilation, and also, sometimes it's not so much even about how much damage the unit does. Destroyer is Undead's only dispel. Mountain Giant uh, is probably more of a tank than a damage dealer for the most part, so then you want to get like taunt with the Mountain Giant and everything. Uh, it's true for Spellbreakers. Spellbreakers burn enemy mana, and uh, that is going to be more useful to make sure that the breaker survives, you get armor upgrades and the breaker survives, so he can apply his feedback anti-magic auto attack modifier more often. And it's not so much about getting attack upgrades on that. Armor can also apply to multiple units from different tr trees. So if you get plating, for instance, from the blacksmith for human, that gives armor to tanks, flying machines, Knights and Spellbreakers, which is a really wide variety of units that can produce from three different buildings. Yeah. Right? It's crazy. But if you get gunpowder, that affects flying machines, tanks, riflemen, right? But it doesn't affect something like Griffin Riders or, or Footmen and so on. So, uh, with the physical armor attack. can be the one to get if you are producing both knights and well, flyings, even if in the. With the physical attack. A close personal instead of the ranged attack, right? Visually, flyings might benefit more from attack upgrades. If, you, if these are the two units you make, you cover a larger swathe of your units by doing armor. Yeah. Based on all of the above, we can create some fun examples that highlight when to get up upgrades, right? If you have eight units and you go from eight to nine units, what is the bonus percentage of damage you get? when you get an upgrade, and what is the bonus percentage of damage you get when you get a ninth unit? Well, it's actually kind of the same, right? Because in situation A, you add one unit, you go from eight to nine units, the ninth unit increases your army's damage by 12.5%. If you're what? only looking at those eight units, not nice. heroes, not other units. Whereas in situation B, that's a 12% damage increase. So it's about the same. So roughly. next time you're in it's roughly the game same. and you have eight units, it's be pretty eight well guns, balanced. Eight archers, eight griffin riders, and you're thinking, shall I add another unit or shall I get an attack upgrade? Know that the DPS of your army roughly goes up by the same amount. Not counting the special situation where you've got attack modifiers like pulverize, dryad slow poison, or uh, spellbreaker feedback. So. There are some considerations that go beyond the DPS output. For example, in this situation A where you add a unit, you also have a unit that requires supply. It adds another body on the field that has their own way of moving. Right? They can body block, they can surround, they can leave by their own volition when you control them to do so. They can go to a new location by themselves. You cannot send a unit upgrade to go to a new location by themselves. They have their own health totals. Uh, they give experience when they die. That ninth unit needs to be reinforced from the base to wherever you are. Especially slow uh, on large maps. That ninth ma unit may have their own mana pool and ability cooldowns. For example, a ninth destroyer can do another dispel magic. Uh, a ninth raider has an ensnare. A ninth druid brings his own rejuvenation and roar uh, mana pool. Yeah. So sometimes you do want that ninth unit. It has some pros and cons, but there are a lot of specificities that may help you make the, the choice to add a ninth unit instead of an attack upgrade or... Very situational, it appears. 
as he's discussing about it right there. It's like very, very situational. An armor upgrade. The same thing is true for adding a ninth unit. The total amount of effective physical health an opponent needs to chew through goes up by 12.5% when you add a ninth grunt. And if you add an armor upgrade, it's the same amount of damage an opponent needs to do to kill those eight grunts. In situation B, you may be adding an attack upgrade instead of a unit. You go from eight units and you add an attack upgrade. So this increases your damage output by 12%. You do not yield experience to opponents when you die, uh, when that ninth unit dies because it doesn't exist. Right? You can only give XP eight times. It does not clutter up the battlefield. It doesn't need to be reinforced in the walking path. Doesn't require supply. Will apply to all future units as well. And the first upgrade is usually cheaper than the ninth unit you may be thinking of making. So when it comes to specific units like dryads, I would probably sooner add a ninth dryad as yeah, I can get I would more too. control via their slow poison. I can do more dispel. I can try to overwhelm someone fast with lots of units. And their damage is more agnostic like keeping when it the comes pressure to up. attack upgrades because slow poison is a component. So if I'm rushing someone, I'm probably getting a ninth dryad rather than one attack upgrade. For sure. Them. But if I am building grunts, I might sooner add a unit armor upgrade rather than a ninth grunt. Grunts are built to die slowly, they're tanky, and I'm often going to be losing quite a bit of them and then replacing them. In a different yeah. situation, you might as the as the match continues on as it's going on you're going to be losing grunts slowly but you will be losing them but as you're losing them your population drops but you're ready to go with something to replace it for your population usually with a raider or something like that because a raider is about three population a grunt's about two population so let's say that you're at 49 out of 50 for your population you want a grunt to die, you drop a grunt, get that raider popping. Makes the sense. That may become fodder. Also, their attack is the same upgrade. So you have a raider coming out with that upgrade already. Yeah. Plus C. In a siege. different situation, you might have a unit that may become fodder because they're getting countered, and then no amount of upgrades or unit additions should uh, be chosen to do because they're becoming obsolete, right? Yeah, if as the I match progresses. Grunts, and I'm thinking of a ninth grunt or an armor upgrade, I might actually be needing to think about not doing any of that because my opponent has six frost worms, right? Doesn't matter if I have one armor upgrade or a ninth grunt because six frost worms will annihilate those grunts and I need to start thinking of not going grunts anymore and starting to get some bat riders, raiders or headhunters or wind riders. So we should rather focus on replacing our army composition to increase its quality rather than dumping any more resources into obsolescent units. Makes sense. There's one more caveat. Most RTS games that don't have heroes have an upgrade system for units which comprises the totality of value add to your armies. And that kind of comes back to this Reddit post that we looked at, at in the start. Uh, this guy likes to upgrade his units fully, but why do some players not do this? And it's because of heroes. Heroes are part of the power build, yeah. the power growth strategy of Warcraft 3 strategies, of Warcraft 3 power growth. Right? Because there are heroes, getting upgrades only affects some of your power, not your heroes. The total value of your total army power that you get from upgrades is reduced. Heroes generally don't enjoy any upgrade. So like that's as I was saying earlier as well, as you have a hero, as you're taking on creep camps, whatever drops from the creep camp, if you have something that gives you an aura or increases the ability of said units that you're rocking with, you know, it just adds to defense and or attack. And if you have a bit of both, right, make them a little bit more tankier, a little bit more strong, also with speed, so on and so forth made from buildings yet comprise a large part of the total power level of your forces think therefore of upgrades that are not called upgrades as also being upgrades so we've got all the upgrades that we mentioned at the start qualitative numerical upgrades transformational upgrades etc but there are other upgrades that aren't called upgrades such as 
What do you think of a potion of invulnerability for uh, a hero? It is an upgrade because it can temporarily turn your hero invincible. Technically. And it makes you have a higher power level when you have it. But it is not a blacksmith upgrade. So whereas in StarCraft someone might be making a zealot attack upgrade, and then they say, okay, cool, I can now two-shot a zergling instead of three-shot a zergling. An invulnerability potion is also an upgrade that costs 150 resources, which is the same amount of resources, iron forged swords for human costs. We go to the iron forged swords, how much does this cost? 100 gold and 50, that's 150 together. Ah, so you can either get iron forged swords or potion of lesser invulnerability from the goblin shop. It's an interesting uh, way in that you have to make, an interesting decision. So, as a Warcraft player, you balance out your investments into upgrades across both your units and your heroes. Examples of hero or even unit upgrades that aren't actually called upgrades, but I see them as upgrades, are as follows. Hero experience. Every time your heroes kill units, either creeps or enemy units, you get experience that gets you level ups and that gets you hero abilities. A level 3 Stormbolt compared to a level 2 Stormbolt is also an upgraded power level. And StarCraft has no analogy for that because StarCraft doesn't have heroes. And this should be weighed in as well. Uh, number five, hero self-buffing permanent item items, such as Ring of Protection, Petty Up to Fatality, uh, Lightning Shield, uh, Staff of Mastery, Mask of Death, Orb of Darkness. There are so many hero self-buffing permanent items, and there are also upgrades. Technically, six, yeah. Hero army buffing permanent items, auras, scourge bone chimes, right? Yeah. Uh, Lion horn, horn of stormwind. Uh, you've got ancient Django of endurance, Katgar's bong of brilliance. A lot of different aura items that buff your units via your heroes. Number seven, hero self consumable items, tomes, tome of agility. Yeah. Potion of lesser invulnerability. Healing Which scroll, is a permanent uh, increase. Heal potion, a mana potion, mana stone, all kinds of consumables, scroll of the beast, right? And then number eight, hero unit buffing consumable items. Heal solve buffs the non-combat regeneration of units. Protection scroll buffs heroes and units in their armor stat, 12% effective health. That's why you usually end up seeing me grab one of the protective scrolls whenever we're about to go into battle and I try to pop it like in a 4v4 if I have uh, my my team with me rarely happens and if I have one of those I try to pop it with my team around so that everybody ends up getting uh, the buff from it right And it, but that's also in an area it's only within a certain amount of area of that range of the area that you're able to do that because everybody could be rushing in on one spot so it'd be like your hero with your units and whatever all your units end up getting the buff because they're close and any other units from uh your teammates that are with you will partially end up getting it not all their units will end up getting it only partial of their units would end up getting it because they're not in the area granted to pop it. Staff of Preservation is uh, uh, buffing your unit's mobility to yep. teleport to your main base. And Healing Scroll gives an instant heal to units all around you. Three of these affect units permanently via direct unit upgrades, the top three. The other five are all untraditional upgrades that do not carry the, na the name upgrades. Therefore, think of Warcraft 3 upgrades and realize only 3 out of 8 uh, are called upgrades and uh, all of them increase your power level. Let's get to the conclusion and my recommendation on upgrades. So when you're deciding when to get upgrades, which ones to get and how to go about your general upgrade strategy, uh, you're engaging with a part of the game that is a large and very enjoyable part of figuring out your game plan in any RTS and Warcraft 3 is no different. The first numerical upgrade is by far the most worth it, as it is the cheapest, represents the largest relative power increase, and also researches the quickest. Yes. For special transformational upgrades, 
try to get upgrades early. Usually this is before your first unit or after your first unit. So I will get one Shaman and then Adept Training so that I have Lightning Shield and I get more Mana Pool and more Mana Regen. Or maybe I get two Shamans and then I get Adept Training. Or maybe three Shamans. And I try to go for like at least two Shamans as I play Orc. I'll try to do the two, do the upgrade. If I don't have two of uh, the Voodoo Lounges up, I will try to get two upgrade as we're going into our Great Hall to get the next upgrade but by the time that upgrade is done we should have a third shaman on the way and or fourth depending on how long it takes for a great hall to upgrade by the time that upgrades we should already have the third to fourth shaman on the way to do the the next upgrade or maybe i get two shamans and then i get a depth training or maybe three shamans and then a depth training and i may eventually get master training and I would even go Master Training Witch Doctor off, of back, off the back of zero Witch Doctors, one Witch Doctor, or two Witch Doctor. These are special transformational upgrades. They change how the unit can be used. Outside of just using Sentry Ward on Witch Doctor, I can now use Healing Ward, which is a massive upgrade. Huge upgrade. I'd rather have one Witch Doctor with Healing Ward than five Witch Doctors with only Sentry Wards. Yes. And so it is very different than the numerical upgrade plan of a blacksmith. For numerical value upgrades, consider getting one upgrade early, as it is fast, cheap, and the largest relative power increase. And it could be as early as when you have about four to six of that unit. Six Huntresses, one attack upgrade. Seven Huntresses, one armor upgrade. Yeah, something like that. Uh, there is a large strategical consideration for when to get upgrades and whether you should get them and whether you shouldn't get them. Maybe you're looking to switch unit type and it's no longer worth investing in Huntress because now you need Archers, which actually have the same unit upgrade. Maybe you need Chimera instead, which have a different upgrade, right? So there are strategical and tactical considerations, but purely numerically, the first attack upgrade, you could get it at four, five or six units. and it, it almost it almost seems worth getting everything upgraded at least once as you progress throughout the game just in case you have to make the switch and then you already have the upgrade ready to go man we are learning a lot the first attack upgrade you could get it at four five or six units and it might make even before that based on many of the reasons we discussed if you enjoyed this video, please consider upgrading this vid in the YouTube algorithm's eyes so more people can upgrade their Warcraft 3 knowledge and their love for games. See you next time. Thanks for watching. That That is pretty intense to think about for percentages, numerical percentages, overall percentages for what is considered an upgrade and what is considered an un untraditional upgrade, auras, so on and so forth what your heroes capabilities of helping your units are and just over everything man my mind's pretty blown i feel if i had this knowledge playing human beforehand i would be able to do something a little bit more extensive with them with a greater knowledge of how other entities within the game work you know but we're going to call it like that that is crazy man i suggest go check out grubby talks check out all the grubby's videos down in the description below is going to be a link to this video to his uh grubby talks page as well uh if you learn something feel free leave a like subscribe all that good stuff uh hit me up on discord pretty much hit me up on any one of my other social media platforms consider becoming a member you will get access to videos a day in advance except for like videos like this where i feel the knowledge needs to be dropped right away because as soon as i'm done recording this i'm pretty much uploading it but i hope everyone's had a fantastic day uh until next time man take it easy and i hope that you learned something because i definitely learned quite a bit while watching and like unpacking what it is that he is discussing in this video and how he is breaking it down as well but yeah no nah, man take it easy everybody peace